today is really um, about uh, helping you understand what SafeScript is, why it's there, and how best to get uh, the, the benefits from it. Um, the, uh, th the whole idea of SafeScript, I suppose, I can remember seeing a, a presentation quite a few years ago, and um, Heath Ledger's dad was, was one of the speakers, and it really hit home uh, why this is so important, because he talked about his son, of course, who, who died from um, uh, a, a multiple uh, episode with using, uh, using a, a cocktail of drugs, and most of them were prescription drugs, I believe. And he, he talked about how important it was and how incredibly um, different it would have been uh, an outcome for his son had there been something like SafeScript around. Uh, and, and I suppose, ironically, uh, uh, Heath was in a movie called uh, Candy. I don't know whether, did anybody see Candy? Uh, it was a, it was a, if you haven't seen it, I, I suggest you do. It was a brilliant movie. And that, was, that, that book was written by a guy called Luke Davies. And I didn't realise this, but Luke Davies actually wrote that book and it was, it was really autobiographical. He, he was actually uh, heavily involved in, uh, in using opioid drugs. He was a drug user himself uh, and he went on to, he's, he's won an Academy Award and done some incredible things with, with other movies as well. But I, I uh, gone off into a tangent already. But anyway, uh, I, I seriously uh, uh, think that that's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant movie, uh, br brilliant movie to watch. But the reason I mention it is because it, it sort of uh, helped me understand that this, this isn't really as much about us as doctors and, and pharmacists as it is about our patients and trying to keep them safe. So it, it rolled out uh, SafeScript uh, last year in the Western PHN and the data was being collected probably for about six months before then. The other important dates are the, the fact that last month, so by, by the end of April, it was available and rolled out for the rest of the state. And, and the really important date to remember, and I'm sure, oh, well, maybe not, not sure, but I think maybe that's why you could be here tonight, is April next year, it's going to be mandatory. So everybody will have to use SafeScript if you're prescribing or if you're dispensing. So the, the first question we need to um, explore is which drugs are going to be involved. And th there's, a, there's a, a list of, of the groups and, uh, and some of the specific drugs. And um, the important thing is that every time we prescribe or dispense one of these drugs, that will automatically be fed into the SafeScript uh, repository and then will be available for other people to, uh, to, to see. The reason the list contains this, this set of drugs is because when it, was, when it was looked at, I think it was the Austin that was uh, given the, uh, the task of a steering committee at the Austin, at the task of working out which drugs should be in it. They looked at the data that was supplied by the coroner uh, and specifically we're looking at safety and the drugs involved in overdose deaths. And that's why this is the list we've got. So there, there's certainly probably a couple of other drugs that could be included in this list uh, that you may think will, uh, we, you know, we, we do see some hazardous use with them, but they weren't necessarily the drugs that came out when, when we looked at the drugs that were actually causing the overdose deaths. So I speak specifically, I suppose, about drugs like tramadol and pregabalin, which aren't on this list. But the ones that are, are everything that's in the safe at my pharmacy, so all of the S8s, and the benzos, the Z drugs, quetiapine, and, and every drug that contains codeine, which is a big shift because it was not that long ago that I was selling mesindol over the counter. Now, if you even prescribe mesindol, that's going to show up on SafeScript, even at, even at a low dose of codeine. So that was number one important point about what's in it. Number two important point is for everybody to, to understand that SafeScript does not tell you whether you can or can't prescribe, nor does it tell you whether you can or can't dispense. It is merely a tool to help you to make that clinical decision. So uh, I, I was talking to a, uh, a patient a few weeks ago who said to me that their doctor had a look at SafeScript and SafeScript said, oh, you know, I, I don't know whether they called it SafeScript, but said that they've got this new online tool and, 
and it told them that they weren't allowed to prescribe this medicine for them. Um, so, you know, maybe he or she was using that as a, uh, as, as a little bit of a uh, defence tool or a, uh, a way of, of getting out of, uh, an, a, 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 you know, a, an event of, of prescribing. But the reality is that it doesn't stop you, even, even if uh, it may give you a notification. And we'll talk about what notifications are in a sec. Um, uh, it, it merely um, changes the situation where in the past we may have prescribed or dispensed effectively with a blindfold on, only knowing what's on our computer, what our history says, what a patient's told us, uh, what, what my dispensed computer might say, maybe a couple of phone calls, but it's, it's certainly not comprehensive. And what's changed now is that we have that comprehensive history. Um, one, of the, one of the issues, especially early on, is that I don't think that patients necessarily understand it. I mean, a, a, a lot of doctors and pharmacists still haven't really grappled with it enough to fully understand it. But patients, uh, certainly lots of them, uh, don't know exactly what it's going to mean. So. I've been presented with situations already where I've gone out to talk to a patient, I had a look at their history, and I've had information that I didn't have before, which altered the way that I wanted to, to then go forward. But the first thing I needed to do was describe to the patient how I got that information, because their reaction was, how do you know? Um, and so I think we have to, especially at the start, when not everybody is, is accessing it yet, so that patients may go to some uh, pharmacies or, or clinics and not be quizzed as much as they may when you're having a look at all that information. So I think it's really important that we prep patients with what it is that we're actually doing. Uh, you know, maybe some patients sort of think, well, you know, is that legal? I haven't given my consent. And as we all know, or if you don't, you do now, that this overrides any, any privacy um, uh, issue that may be there. It, 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 Paul will describe it in better terms a bit later, but uh, where we don't have to seek any approval to use SafeScript from the patient. It's information that is there for their safety. Uh, this isn't really easy to see on the on the uh, screen, but you've got it in your uh, in your little package. But it really just shows you diagrammatically what happens uh, in the in the process now when. Uh, with the evolution of, uh, of, of SafeScript. Uh, and it was pointed out to me for the first time at our last uh, presentation that there is probably one arrow missing because the information that feeds to the doctor, the first uh, rectangle, probably needs to feed the other way as well because the doctor's script is also going into, uh, into, the, um, into the SafeScript catchment. So basically, a patient will visit the doctor as they, as they usually do. The doctor will um, uh, prescribe, have, have, a, have a consultation, decide to possibly prescribe a medicine, get that up onto their uh, prescribing software. Now, th this is where it's going to alter a little bit depending on what stage you're at, because if you have the latest version of your prescribing software, then uh, you'll you'll uh, you'll get information that, that comes in the form of a notification sent directly to your screen as a pop-up um, without you having to separately log into SafeScript. So it's going to be much easier. You may say, but no, that doesn't happen with mine. I'm already on. By the way, how many people have already had a bit of a play and are already registered with SafeScript in the room? Uh, probably about half, which is great. For, for those that aren't as acquainted, there'll be, there'll be more um, uh, description of what I'm talking about with the notifications and alerts in a minute. But if, if you are on the latest version of your prescribing software, you'll get a notification which will come into effect before you press the last button, before you press print. So you'll be able to make your decision as to whether you still want to prescribe that drug, maybe that strength, those directions, if you want to alter something, before you get to the point of actually um, prescribing it, which is obviously um, the way it should be and, and beneficial. And in the same way, we, we also have that on our uh, dispensing software so that before we get to the end, I think it's the penultimate key we hit, uh, we'll get a notification if that's required. So that information um, uh, feeds in, 
the doctor prescribes, the patient ends up with a prescription, the prescription comes to the pharmacy, the, the script is then scanned or entered manually. Again, at that penultimate stage, I'll get a notification if there's an issue with SafeScript and we'll run through what those issues are in a sec. Uh, if, I, if I go ahead and dispense it, that information will then be transmitted into SafeScript. Only doctors and pharmacists can put information into SafeScript and the Department of Health all obviously has access and can oversee what's happening as well. You can't directly go into SafeScript and change anything. The only way things get changed in SafeScript or added or subtracted is through your software or my software when, when there's a prescribing or a dispensing event. If you prescribe something and then you cancel it, it'll come up cancelled on this. If you prescribe it, give it to the patient, cancel it after they leave, which I hope doesn't happen very often, but if you did, then I'd scan it at my pharmacy, or I'd enter it, and it would come up as a cancelled script, so I'd see that. I could still, again, I could probably override that and, and um, uh, dispense it manually, but I would get a notification that that's a cancelled script. Now we're going to have a little bit of a system demonstration. So for people that have already logged on, they will be familiar with this, this screen that's going to pop up. Now, if, if the uh, system is, is um, incorporated into your dispense as it is with, with pharmacy or your prescribing software, then when one of those drugs is uh, either prescribed or dispensed, and a notification comes up automatically. If you hit on that notification, then it will take you straight into this field, provided you've logged in. If you haven't logged in, then you'll have to log in. And logging in is similar to the process that you do with your bank, where you'll get a, uh, a number sent to your phone, a password, that you'll then need to um, put into the field. That'll take you into SafeScript, which will then ask you for another quick password, which can be your personal password that you use continuously. You don't have to change that. So that can be a really simple password that you use every day. Uh, and that one will, will jump you straight into this field. So it might sound a bit complicated. It's actually very easy. And, and when you, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's best described, I suppose, by just doing it yourself and it becomes quite intuitive. So we're now into um, our, our SafeScript screen. If we went via um, that notification, then these fields would already be populated. If, on the other hand, we're going into it without going through a notification, we then have to populate with first name, surname, and, and date of birth. So what's changed for pharmacists is that now you'll, you'll, pharmacists will be aware that the uh, date of birth is popping up on all scripts for, for, uh, for, for um, uh, certainly for, for these drugs on the list, uh, which in the past wasn't there. I mean, uh, your medical uh, software always had date of birth. We didn't always have that entered. So that's changed. So we're now uh, hit return. Our patient comes up. We hit on uh, April Adams down below. And, what, and so what opens up is, is her whole... Uh, history as of probably something like uh, a year ago? 1st of July. 1st of July last year. Okay, so just under. Um, now, that, that screen is almost identical for uh, a doctor or a pharmacist logging in with the exception of the permit and correspondence. So that's the only difference. Just those two tiles are missing on the pharmacist screen. And that is because obviously we're not going to be issuing permits and we, we also don't have any correspondence from DHS about permits or patients. So other than that, the screens are identical. Um, there are a couple of uh, filters, uh, a, a drug search um, and events, which just means that we can simplify these um, entries by just looking at prescribed events. So just the, uh, the three prescribed. Uh, or we can jump on to dispensed, and again, we'll just see the dispensed events. Um, we can filter by a date range, or we can look at uh, drug uh, classes if you, if you want. Although I find that usually the one I'm using most often is really just 
uh, when you drop down all events and you either look at prescribed or dispensed events and that can simplify the, uh, the screen for you. So if you hit on one of those uh, lines, it then will open up with more information about the, um, in this case it's a prescribing event, so it will give you more information about what's happened. Uh, it, it'll tell you the, uh, the clinic, the name of the doctor, possibly uh, some, this is just a test one, but possibly uh, some um, contact details. If we close that down and open up one of the uh, dispense events, um, it'll give us again information about the, uh, the pharmacist and uh, which pharmacist it was, wh wh where the pharmacy was and who the prescriber was, if we have that information. And, and that kind of presents another important point, which is sometimes the information that a prescriber will see when they write a prescription is going to be different to what I see when it arrives at the pharmacy to dispense it. So it might have been appropriate to write at the time, whereas once by the time it comes to me, there might be a couple of other dispense events that the doctor didn't see when that was written, which may make my decision to dispense or not different. It might, it might mean that it's unsafe. So you might find a situation where it's, it's been written, perfectly valid, everything's fine, it comes to me and I decline to dispense it. Uh, and then the action I take is, is going to be dependent on lots of things and we can go into that if you like. But. The pharmacy, the pharmacist will also put, because sometimes the practitioner will add on dispense fees um, in every five days or... So stage supply, certainly in directions, you'll, you'll find the directions that have been typed in onto the label by the pharmacist. <coughs> um, yeah, so uh, that, that's an initial overview. Of course, um, the, the sorts of things we're looking at are, are the, the dates it was pre prescribed, dispensed, the quantities, has, has it been presented, has script, have scripts been presented at a lot of different pharmacies, are there multiple prescribers, and they're the sorts of things that are going to help us and inform us to make a decision as to what is going to be appropriate prescribing or dispensing. Also because, you know, I think some people's notes or what they call a note can be one line. Other people like to get a little bit colourful with their notes and their, their note could be uh, two pages. So, and then the onus would be on you to read all of those notes. Okay. Now I've talked about notifications. This is an overview of what a notification is. A notification is that message that pops up on your screen every time you dispense one of or prescribe one of those drugs that's on the list that we saw earlier. So each time you'll get either a green notification, it'll pop up on your screen and a green notification tells us that there's really nothing to see in this history that would alarm us or would tell us that there's, there's an unsafe uh, event in the history. It doesn't mean you can't go into SafeScript and have a look at a patient's history, but, it, but it's, it's gone through its algorithm and it's saying that we don't think that there's any problem. That may be because there hasn't been in the last six months the dispensing of any of these drugs, or it may be because there was only a single prescriber. Uh, and there's no other reason for an alert. It's not a high dose, um, so you'll get a green notification. If on the other hand you get either an amber or a red notification, so either of those two, come April next year when, when this is mandatory, you must go into SafeScript and check why that notification has come up, what the history is, and, and then make your decision as to whether it's still appropriate. The amber obviously is a little bit less hazardous than, than the red, uh, and the amber uh, will will pop up with a lower. Uh, what, what it does is it looks at the uh, the opioid drugs, and it it, it categorizes uh, or it, it converts the drugs into a uh, a morphine equivalent dose. If that morphine equivalent dose falls between 50 and 100 milligrams on average over the past 90 days per day, uh, it will then give an amber alert. If it's over 100 milligrams, it'll give a red alert. Now there are a couple of other ways those alerts will pop up. Um, we, you'll get a, a red alert when prescriptions from four or more prescribers <coughs> or uh, four or more pharmacies have, have been activated on SafeScript. So that will give you a red alert. 
The reason is because, again, just, just looking at the coroner's uh, data, the coroner uh, identified that when there was an overdose death, typically, often, what was happening was there, was, uh, there were patients that were seeing four or more prescribers or, or going to four or more pharmacies. So it's as simple as that. Uh, the other high-risk uh, drug combination that this is, is going to monitor is where methadone or fentanyl is prescribed in combination with either benzos or other long-acting opioid drugs. And that will also every time pop up an alert. So even for a patient that you have uh, stable on, on methadone who may also have uh, a prescription for a benzo, and they're the only two things that are in the history, you will get a red alert that pops up on your screen. Uh, so it doesn't mean that you can't continue to prescribe, but it's just one of those categories that has seemed to be quite um, high on the list of potential overdose deaths.